Namaste and welcome to Future Leaders, produced by Today's Youth Asia. In this TV show, we talk about innovation, inspire leadership and nurture concerns for a better world. My name is Aina and today we have the privilege of having with us Mr. Santosh Shah, founder and president of Today's Youth Asia. He is also the anchor and director of the television talk show, Power Talks. Diplomatic Career Magazine, published from Washington, D.C., and Young Professionals in Foreign Policy Organization with its headquarters in Washington, D.C., have published Top 99 Most Influential Young International Professionals Under 33. Santosh Shaha has been included in the list of Top 99 Under 33. How would you like to define yourself as an inspirational figure to youths across the world? I think that's a pretty big title, like how do I want to inspire the entire youth population of the world. Uh, the least I can tell is, at least I try to inspire myself. Um, as you know, working in the political, social, and, and financial status of Nepal is a very difficult one. And uh, it requires a lot of, lot of self-inspiration to be able to carry any work that you are doing uh, in Nepal and in many countries which face similar problems. One thing that may come out of uh, me being from Nepal and being under the list of uh, top 99 under 33 uh, for other youths from many other countries would be that it does not really require you to be in a developed country with strong economy and with great education systems provided to you to be able to do something that can be recognized globally. And uh, if, you, if you see, look at the works that we have been doing, most of the works uh, can, can be translated into international sectors like we have produced English media, we have interacted with uh, figures from all over the world, we have discussed global issues, we have, we have even involved young people like you to talk about uh, foreign, foreign affairs. So I think uh, something, let's say a group of youths in any country in Africa or South America or even South Asia can look at it and say that if being in a country which is considered very isolated from the rest of the world, uh, if you can come out with something that in involves the entire world, then it's possible in many, many parts of the, uh, of the world. Like, I think Africa, African countries is more, is more globally connected in terms of airlines and connectivity uh, compared to Nepal. And uh, a lot of countries in Asia are also in the em em emerging sectors. Uh, but it's very late that we hear uh, any young inspirational figures or successful success stories in the in the serious fields. We sometimes hear in the film industry, fashion, and sports, of course, but uh, not much in the in, in the areas of inventions. So I think uh, uh, this could also be like an uh, like a case study. Uh, if I, I mean, I don't want to use the word example but a case study to see that what is it that my team did and I did and uh, we collectively worked on what are the ways we took uh, to get on a, on a list of global uh, top 99 under 33. So that's how I would, I would look at it. Generally Nepalese youths have this impression that protesting and violence is the only way to have their voices heard but you were able to achieve a lot without resorting to any of these options. How were you able to do it? That's a very important question because uh, I started my works in 2002 when the civil war was still going on. Uh, 2002, I think we had our more than 4,000 citizens killed in the civil war uh, during that year. Then uh, from 2004, the pro-democratic movement started uh, almost a year later, where I myself filmed the protests and riots, and I saw young people younger than me and of my age uh, resorting to different violent means to achieve this wholesome, this, this natural organic concept of democracy. Uh, I, I myself uh, am not very particular about using a violent way or resorting to violence to achieve uh, what you can achieve because 
there are many roads that leads to the same goal and some people think violence is the main way is the shortcut and uh, maybe it is but sometimes uh, shortcut leads you to destruction also and and we have seen in our own political culture that whichever political leaders or political parties resorted to violence are having tough time uh, leading the country or even governing their own political party uh, in my own case uh, were there instances where i would have resorted to violence yes there were uh, i had received death threats which i didn't uh, this is the first time i'm telling it in public uh, for doing good works for training young people for putting for putting voices international voices out in the media why because there's a lot of money and a lot of power which has been handed over from the past and since 1990 when we got the democracy common people started emerging into the mainstream i come from a farming a modest farming background uh, from a very remote village so for a young person from that kind of background to come and make it big in the mainstream is something that challenges the old system which is very well networked and it's very strong and it's very rich so although i didn't want to be strong rich or hold a position snatch the position from somebody i tried to do something very unique and something very new so i didn't have to compete anybody or take anybody's bread and butter but still when you do something that challenges system or old mechanism you naturally gain enemies and when you gain enemies they they do what the enemies should do and which which i faced uh what helped me uh from not resorting to violent means was the young people like you whom i have been training let's say if i was working for any marginalized group with x percentage of population in the country who says let's go on a protest right away let's burn tires let's let's torch a vehicle then probably my actions would have been very different because when you lead a group the mindset of the mass does matter it doesn't really matter sometimes what i personally feel and uh, you see in our country everywhere uh, people are resorting to strikes and violence to to achieve even something very very insignificant but in my case since i was uh, training and educating a lot of uh, young people like you who whom the moment i look at i feel there is a lot of promise in you uh, you understand your country you understand the world and i can wait for 20 years to see that you are producing something tangible i think i have that kind of patience to to not be very particular about achieving it tomorrow like i want to get rich tomorrow i want to get popularity tomorrow i want to be successful tomorrow i think i can wait for 20 years uh, for you guys to get into the mainstream not that there is a huge is a gap between us but uh, we can get into the mainstream uh, in 20 years 15 years and then make a difference and i think i have that kind of patience the second thing is uh, i have followed the biography of uh, leaders who resorted to non non violent ways of achieving their goal i also see read the profiles and biography of the leaders who resorted to violent ways of uh, of achieving what they want to want to achieve it looks like on the long term let's say if you look at 500 years or let's say even 50 years the leaders who resorted to peaceful ways creative ways are the one who are more respected who are more happy as a person and who i feel had more self satisfaction in their life so no matter i live in the same condition as you with water scarcity no electricity uh, not not having enough human resources to be around uh, there is a strike air pollution um financial crisis political crisis and all and still still i have a pretty happy life and i i pretty enjoy my my daily life in kathmandu uh, i do get to travel to many developed countries and uh, where everything works everything is perfect looks perfect uh, but in 3 4 days i get very bored because there is you know that kind of drive is missing you know there's nothing you can change there there's nothing you can do uh, from my perspective of course for the citizens in that country they will have different areas where they could work and and move things forward so i think that was my way of uh, resorting to non violent ways and peaceful ways and creative ways and i think we are pretty successful to, in today's time i would say in, by the end of 2011 uh, in almost 
we'll, we'll enter the 10th year of our establishment. And I would say that uh, our way was pretty right. I mean, it, we are in the mainstream of the country, and now we are entering into the Asian region, and maybe in the future in the global sector. And uh, uh, we have done it with creativity. We haven't had any controversies. We haven't had any fights. We didn't have to be beaten up or beat somebody up. Uh, we didn't have to beg for money from some donors. Uh, it was very organic, self-grown, homegrown, and uh, it involved a lot of uh, young people like you, your parents, your teachers, uh, my parents, my teachers, and my supporters. And I think this is how we have come up. So um, among the, my fellow top 98 winners, I'm 99th, so I can uh, give these examples and say that this worked out in Nepal and maybe in some other countries also it can work out. You are the only South Asian to have been included in the top 99 uh, list. Um, so what are your future um, plans for your endeavors? Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned South Asia. That's the plan now. The plan is that uh, Nepal is very neutrally placed in South Asia. We have uh, India and Pakistan who has a six decade history of enmity and, and violence and you know, mistrust among themselves. And uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with Indian youths in India and Pakistani youths in Pakistan. And I see that uh, they want to set off their burden from the past. The, the baggage that they have been given from their grandparents' generation is very heavy and very painful and they're still carrying it. The young generation want to forgive and forget the past and move ahead. Now, if uh, they initiate, if the Indians, not that the Indians and Pakistani leaders have not initiated the uh, initiative to get them together, they have done. There's a lot of mistrust there. And as Nepali, I see that we have that advantage as we play a neutral. We are friends with Pakistanis, we are fr friends with uh, India, and uh, we think uh, we can invite them and we can, we can create an atmosphere where they can talk to each other, where they can become friends, where they can sort out their differences from the past. Uh, at the same time, uh, South Asia is a very, uh, if you look at it, we are very good with uh, brains and we are also very good with muscles. Um, so, so you have like one of the world's greatest scientists in this region and you have of people who are willing to do any level of physical work and construct bridges and roads and houses. Um, you have countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Maldives, Afghanistan, Bhutan. They all have their own unique approach. Uh, let's look at the religion. We have Hindus in India, Nepal, and other countries also. We have Buddhists in Sri Lanka and in Nepal and India. We have Muslims in Maldives. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and we also have all the other world's religion in this region. So in terms of religious harmony also, this is a very fertile area. Unfortunately, certain groups and certain political figures use this as means to stay in power and, and, and get global attention to themselves. And I don't see a reason why we should sacrifice millions of people and put a billion population at risk to keep 10 different individuals on the power list. You know, we live in a democracy where everybody is equal and, and share equal human rights. Whether you are the president of the country or, the, or whether your job is to mend shoes in that particular country, I personally see that both are the same human beings. Of course, they may go to different offices and somebody may go to the streets to work, but ultimately it's about taking care of yourself and your family. And I don't see any reason why we should allow the current leaders uh, to use these differences of religion, of ethnicities, of even citizenship to create a divide. And uh, being from South Asia, recognized on a global sector, this is how I'm going to communicate uh, to, to my fellow winners in, uh, from U.S., from Europe, and from the rest of the world saying that let's look at South Asia as an integrated region and let Nepal, which is also geographically placed on the highest altitude and in the center in the north, be a point of convergence for all these differences. 
and young people like you can host the young leaders from all over South Asia. And you could, you could tell them what great works that you are doing. You could ask them what great works that they are doing or what great dreams they have for the region. And South Asia is, a, is a, also an area where we have this hierarchical mentality. We wait for the grandparents to lead and then our, we wait for our own parents' generation to ease out until they can lead. I think I have already changed that narrative. I'm 30 and I'm already in the mainstream. I have to compete people who are in 50s, 60s, not just in Nepal now, but in the, in the, in the, pretty soon in the South Asian region. So, and this has been pretty successful. I'm still safe and alive and still things are going on. So now I think I can tell that I experimented with my own concept on myself. And I think the result came out pretty good. So everybody can enter into their own respective field and move ahead. And if you look at a couple of American examples, at the age of 17, people make it big. Whether in the entertainment industry and now even in politics, people in the mid-20s mid or in 20s are entering into the political sector and they're doing pretty well. Um, so that's where I see South Asia coming in the picture. I've already initiated the communications with many young leaders in South Asia. We're trying to see how we can invite them in 2012 to Kathmandu and vice versa. Then, then they can get empowered and get ideas about how to connect to other countries in South Asia and carry this forward. How do you find yourself uh, different from other people who are involved in the same profession as you are? I'm involved in three different sectors. One is media, second is youth activism, third is development. In all these three sectors, uh, I'll, I'll try to touch upon. In media, I try to look into future. I try to see where this statement from the politician or representative of some other government can lead into in 10 years or five years. Whereas media, most of the time we are looking backwards and seeing what happened in the past and where, what has happened uh, in the past that is leading to this statement. Uh, when I try to uh, set up my own questions, I try more to look into the future, of course with some context from the past. But I want to know what the world is going to look like in 10 years, in 50 years. What are our accents uh, like translating into, into uh, the scenario of, of the world in several years from now? Because we as young people, uh, we can suffer right now because this is our studying phase, we're struggling age. But let's say when we hit 40s or 50s, uh, that's the time when we contemplate in life and look at the world around yourself. We worry about our families because we're taking care of them. And uh, I think uh, media plays a very important role in how to save the world because you're constantly questioning politicians, leaders, development sectors. If you don't question them right, they don't uh, go in the right direction. And I constantly keep saying that you cannot look behind and drive forward because if you do that, everybody knows what's going to happen. You're going to meet an accident and go to a hospital or to a graveyard. And that's what is happening right now. That's what the media is driving everybody towards. And that's why we see so much of violence in the world because everybody is meeting accidents in one way or other. So if we looked into 20 years from now and, and we framed our media works, that's how it's going to lead. Second, in the youth sector, what normally happens in the youth organizations is the youth organization, and this does not apply to everybody, but most, mostly, they wait for the ideas to come from the donors. Whatever, wherever, the, okay, where is the fund? There's a fund in civic participation, so let's do that project. Where is the fund? There's fund in climate change in 2000, so let's do that project. Where is the fund? Maybe next year there will be fund in something else and, and everybody will jump towards it. Now, who are, the guide, uh, who are the guys who are creating these ideas? They may not necessarily be the young people. Maybe there is a fund created in some big office somewhere in the world. And I don't understand why the young people in some other country, where probably there is no need of that issue, they get involved just because there is some hard cash. When I look at the young population, I see that they themselves have ideas. They know the scenario, the country they live in. And probably they know how to solve it also. I should not undermine a 15-year-old person just because this person does not have a PhD from a university in some developed country. If we look at our own South Asian history from 10,000 years, it's always been the young people in the teenage and in the 20s who have given success stories. Look at Ramayana, look at Mahabharata. 
We don't have any stories from them when they hit 30s. All the stories that we have from the past, you know, you, you read any scriptures or any history book, or even mythologies, most of the stories, success stories of great crown prince, a great leader, a great thinker, are from the people who were, when they were teenager or when they, when they were in 20s. So, and it has worked. It, it's been there for many years. So I, I personally feel that allowing young people to come up with their own, uh, own ideas, you know, and their own suggestions on how to solve certain issues, and of course trying to find out who can guide them. And I use a lot of advisors and guide, guides, people to guide me who are in the mainstream and in, in different age, age groups. But I think we should first listen to the young people, and that's what we do. So that's, that's our youth sector. Third thing is development sector. If you look at the world today, the poor countries rely on the rich countries, and they don't work to earn themselves. They wait until the rich countries donate the money so that they can spend. And then the rich countries, without understanding the grassroots reality, no matter how much research they do, uh, of the developing countries, they spend the money without knowing what they're going to get in return. So on one hand, a larger percentage of the global population is not working, relying on a smaller percentage of the world who are earning money. On the second hand, the people in the rich countries, they're, they're spending twice you know, for their own, to keep their own country rich, and then to, 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 they're working twice. And the, and the guys from developing countries are not working at all. And that's the development sector. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that because if you're going to wait for somebody to pour in money to develop your place, you're never going to have enough money to develop your place. Because the actual richness, the actual money comes from your own area. And if your area cannot support your own development, then you should not do that kind of development because it's very unsustainable. What drives development in most part of the world are the reports. You're, you're very responsible to provide to the person whom you have do, who has donated the development program, and that's necessary. But that becomes a sole motive most of the times. And when things look good in the paper, it looks like things are going on in reality. That versus our approach to development is first see what the people in the grassroots want or the need. Maybe their priority is very different than what we want to take to their village. You know, maybe you want to go and feed them with imported chocolate bars. Maybe their requirement is just to have a bowl of rice. Second thing is ask them how they want to solve this. Because we have to be very careful about people's cultural sensitivities, religious sensitivities. I cannot go to your village and want to change everything. What right do I have just because I hired somebody from your village for a very high cost? Does that give me right to enter into your area and destroy everything? Because that's what's happening everywhere. If development worked the way it's working since last 50 years, I think we have, we have already received enough money to develop this country. But we don't see that happening. Things are going towards uh, failure. I mean, we see a lot of failures in reality, but not in the papers necessarily. So how do we do the development? One, we try to raise support from the grassroots itself. We try to say that we don't pay the salaries. We want you to find a, a real job and then devote X percentage of your time to the development works. And that has worked because people take uh, ownership in that, in that project. Second thing is we try to raise whatever money we can raise from the, from the local. Like we have projects in Birgans on the border area with anti-drugs trafficking and, and drug, against drugs use and, and trafficking of various kinds. We raise money from the rickshaw pullers, and that could be 10 rupees, very insignificant uh, in number, but very significant when it comes to 100 rickshaw pullers putting their money and taking the ownership uh, in what we are doing. So there is no confusion, there is no doubt, there is no suspicion about who is funding us, what our motives are, because it's very clear we involve the people. Uh, the other thing that we do is whenever we work with international partners, uh, the regular culture is that you charge them three times more, like the corporate product rates, the selling price. But let's not get confused. We're not selling a product here. We're doing a non-profit work. So there should be no profit. 
involved here. So if something costs 100 rupees, then we tell our supporters that you take care of X percent and I take care of Y percent. Now, what the, the cost that we incur could not, may not necessarily be in cash. It could be like finding a place where we can hold the, hold the conference or the event for free. So, you know, other partners in, and not, not, pay, not pay a price for that. And we've even used five-star hotels for that. Use uh, human resources without paying them and asking them to volunteer. Now, of course, it's very easy to go with hard cash and then convince anybody to work for you. But it's going to take real talent and perseverance and hard work to convince somebody to work for you without making them pay. And that's where the sense of ownership comes. So if you look at our works, we've been very successful in the last 10 years. Uh, I thought this would take me 40 years to reach where, where, where we have reached uh, collectively. Uh, but it took us 10 years, which is pretty fast for, for, for how things function in our country. So these are my, my different approaches, and it has worked. And right now, I'm looking forward to sharing this uh, mechanism with other countries in the world to see if they can reduce their cost and maximize their success uh, using some of the formulas that we have used. And we'll, we are also open to see with whether others have better ways of working and which we could also bring to our country. With this, we've come to the end of today's show. Thank you very much, Mr. Santosh Shah, for being with us and sharing your insightful thoughts and ideas. We look forward to your feedback. Our email address is youthtya at the rate gmail.com. Thank you for watching us. We hope to see you next week at the same time. Have a great week. Namaste.